Um, disclaimer, no one gives a fuck about our show. So we're good. Um, We are back, episode six. Welcome, uh, meaningful times with friends. Uh, wow, it's amazing that we've gone this long and we're we're still friends. Yeah, uh, around the let's introductions. Jason, Nathan from Newark, Ramshackle Dan. Uh, we got that down efficiently now. No beating around the bushes here, fellas. You're right down to it. Via somebody uh, communicating with Ramshackle Dan, their exact words were, I didn't realize that Dave was so woke, which uh, frankly offended me. Because um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't care for the appropriation of this term woke. That uh, It's another case of uh, street vernacular, urban street vernacular, that was uh, appropriated. Woke became the the today's version of right on brother uh, with the non-black community that was trying to be down with, you know, the pretty much black community because it, it came from a term mainly stay woke, uh, where the uh, the initial intention of woke was really in reference to uh, I got the definition behind me. A term that's backwards in my window that I can't read, but um, basically it was uh, <laughs> referring to uh, to racial injustices. Okay, so that's where, you know, it was like, keep your eyes open, you know, at all times, because a lot of shit's, you know, fucked up, you know, as far as, you know, race. Um, but then it got, I first was made aware of woke uh, being in the comedy community, because if there's anything that I've learned from being in the comedy community is that uh, comedians are so obsessed, aspiring comedians mostly are so obsessed with this thought of uh, being on the right side of history, as if anybody is going to care about them in another you know, year, let alone 5, 10, 50 years. And um, so the, there were people that would be talking about, oh, I, you know, I like to be woke. I'm trying to stay woke and da, 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 da in their sets. And I was I just kind of was like, who cares? Um, and then it got really appropriated uh, by the by the right wing media circuits as being all encompassing of any progressive agenda. So that's what now woke to even somebody who probably was thinking it wasn't, you know, any big deal to mention a ramshackle here. Uh, I didn't realize that Dave was so woke. I'm not. Uh, it's, this is pretty much mostly the same, but, you know, I keep an open mind and shit, but here's the thing. <laughs> I have bigoted thoughts. I just don't <laughs> talk about them. And I definitely don't put them on social media or anything else. Or if I am, it's in jest. So let and me ask you this, Ramshackle, was there one thing in particular that was said that caused this person to comment upon Dave's wokeness? I didn't ask. I think it's okay. just, I think it's just the general um I think this person has seen Dave stand up a lot and was surprised at kind of the the political or sociological takes juxtaposed with what he sees on stage. I think that was it. Yeah, cuz my my act clearly is so hate driven. Um but I mean I, I think so. That's why I like it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> given given uh, my yeah. white nationalist leanings, I'm just like, yeah, this guy gets me. And then I'm on the really, podcast. Really, like, what happened to Mean Dave? Probably my mo my most inappropriate joke is uh, is one that's on my my social media, uh, you know, my TikTok and my oh, the kids in my, cages. Thing? Yeah, kids in cages. Exactly, uh, and, and that's a tribute to my grandparents. I dare say that if my if the fact that I've told this joke both on stage and to my relatives, they're they're you know my aunts and uncles, uh, especially the ones that would get upset at like my type my brand of humor. And I've made them laugh at that. that. I do uh, love my grandma and my grandpa very much. Um, and they were, you know, they were, you know, people that came from a rough era, era rough background. 
all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that, you know, I get to have what sounds like such an insensitive joke. <laughs> That's just basically, yeah, they, they passed away before we started hearing about kids in cages because they would have been extremely upset. They didn't think of that shit first. So that's <laughs> anyways, back to this woke shit, uh, Jason, any <laughs> thoughts of, uh, of, of wokeness, uh, whatever. Well, uh, not really. I mean, uh, primarily it feels like woke has really been completely co-opted by uh republican assholes um so it's almost like uh there's almost no value in the term anymore that's uh, what that's what that's what bugs me is that when it's brought up it's it, even in a context where people think they're using it correctly who would never use the term they're using it in terms of how how that that end of the spectrum redefined it yeah this is anything progressive any any kind of like a, a message of compassion or or any sense of just basic human empathy oh you're woke and it's like fuck you you know i have my insensitivities just like anybody else it's really it's i always say the whole woke thing is more like uh it's like if the word cool became politicized oh you're anti-cool man you know just something what it really is good for now is just finding out how uh how bigoted someone is just uh beneath the bullshit when they want to use the term to try and you know it's like yeah i don't really care for all this woke shit i'm like oh okay so i get it you want to you want to just you want to be consciously bigoted understood thoughts ramshackle yeah i mean that's a pretty woke explanation fuck uh, you <laughs> I, I think it's I think you're right, Jason. I think it's a it's a pejorative. It's to basically categorize a uh, a type of uh, left wing um, <laughs> or category or collection of left wing thoughts. That is really, really distracting, Dave. Um, <laughs> between that and Jason's failure shirt, I feel like I'm on acid again. Um, <laughs> my, mug is, my mug is woke. I got oh, a woke mug. Oh, oh, look, there's a Hispanic person on that mug. Dude, yeah, why couldn't man. you get a mug with a white guy on it? Really? Well, I am white, too. <laughs> apparently, according to everybody that forgets I'm Mexican, completely, you know, conveniently. It, it's, it's here, Here's the thing. It, it's it's a convenient dustbin to throw a bunch of thoughts into without thinking about it. And it goes Damn both right. Ways. It's part about the stupid WWE. I'm going to just keep hammering this point that Dave made a couple episodes ago. It's the same WWE Heel and hero, depending on which side you're on, you're not really listening to either side and call both sides of That's called critical thinking. Like people have different thoughts and they're just dismissing each other and hating each other. And woke is another pejorative to dismiss all of the points of view that fall into that what Dave described. And there are, again, there are, there are both sides to every argument. You can say one's right and one's wrong. But either way, woke is an example of not engaging the thoughts and the ideas it's an, it's a dismissive term um and i'm i'm and i'm just happy they used it on dave i'm gonna i'm gonna call you ramshackle damn right <laughs> and it makes sense why comedians were so compelled before it became uh such a such a, a right-wing uh media tool it uh why comedians were also the ones to blow it up because anything like i hear about so much that goes on in in our pop culture and whatever from comedians trying so desperately like oh something happened and then ev i only know because so many of these thirsty motherfuckers want to say something about it and think that they're the first one to say something like last night the uh the i learned that jonah hill sent some very insensitive texts to uh, some gaslighting texts uh that that his ex-girlfriend a surfer uh, a cute surfer gal i don't know her name um but she uh she outed him as being a uh an abusive texter so uh so we're you know jonah hill is 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 now officially uh just a standard issue human being of who sends terrible texts to people so are we canceling people anymore or have we are we post cancel I think there's a, I think it's more of a, I don't think it's so much canceling is just like, uh, I mean, it's definitely an attempt to, but in the end it's, I mean, it, I mean, when I saw him like, Oh, a celebrity sent a shitty text to his ex-girlfriend. Oh no. Um, and a, a series of shitty texts. 
people, and, go, uh, people go out callous to some stuff. It just like comes in waves. Like things cease to be shocking anymore. I mean, if you think about what was considered shocking um, 25, 30 years ago that are just normal, it's the Overton window. Um, it just keeps expanding. And I think that people are just like Dave said, like Dave, Dave's reaction was right. Like, oh yeah, he's a normal person that has, uh, you know, flaws and, and characteristics of everybody else. Um, and then you'll see the the reactions for people they really want to get rid of. They, you know, they still deplatform people from social media. And the the extreme piece is debanking people, which is which is pretty hardcore because you really in this day and age, you can't do um you can't live life if you don't have a bank account. Um, and so that's like that's the next level that I am seeing now is people people were getting kicked off of when they're getting kicked off of social media, they're getting kicked off of PayPal and Venmo and stuff. Um, and now they're getting kicked. They're getting kicked out by like banks if they really, really don't like you. So I haven't heard about that yet. I mean, I but I mean, I'm, I believe you. I just haven't. I haven't. The guy. So there's this politician who um, I'm sure you guys would find re- uh, repugnant, but he is a marvelous shit talker. Mm-hmm. Um, he used to go in the EU and just rant for um, 15 minutes about the illegitimacy of the EU as a governing body. And again, I don't care about the politics. He was just a major, like major league shit talker. His name is uh, Nigel Farage. And mm-hmm. he was the one who led Brexit in uh, in Britain to get away from the EU. Gotcha. And he just got debanked. Um, they basically just canceled his bank accounts. It happened to a couple other political figures. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like I said, there's, you know, there's the callus and then it ratchets up. And I think that's the next thing you're going to see um, to try and silence people is to uh, take away their ability to do business. Well, I, well, I mean, it's already that kind of already. Here's the thing: uh, European money, it's not real money. So, what are you really canceling? In our, but, in uh, this world of of America that only exists, the rest of the world doesn't. The deep banking is really just in the the lack of work, as we see fit, and it's only it's primarily with celebrities. The fact is, if you have enough money, as a as we call it, fu money. Uh, you can't, they won't be canceled. And the funny thing is usually when they have that money and if they do have a platform, they like to act like they're persecuted, you know, like, like Rogan, there were, you know, people were talking, you know, as if Rogan was persecuted. I'm like, the guy has never been paid more by Spotify and, uh, Spotify does all the mental gymnastics as the current term is to, to justify any of the, the stuff on his program. I don't, I'm not bothered by it. I'm more bothered by the fact that I used to enjoy his program and until I just realized how repetitive and long it is talking about or getting interesting people and talking about barbecuing meat with them. So <laughs> I just can't see the debanking thing working in the United States. Even the shittiest, most racist, hateful people in the US have merch. You know what I mean? Uh, the thing is, debanking has definitely been like a traditional. Uh, tool to wipe out adult entertainment companies and sex workers Boom. Yeah, and that's actually you know the next step if you're gonna if you're really reading the tea leaves they're talking about this in the un and everywhere else is going to a complete like getting a cashless society and going to a digital currency and you know people think it's uh that's great it's more convenient but to jason's point if you're living in the margins especially you know the first thing you think of is sex workers um you can't exist in in a situation like that because you're constantly um you're being monitored at that point i mean there's no way around it and so if you control the money you pretty much control people's um what they can do and what they can't do and that's kind of the that's the prevailing fear when you start hearing more about central bank digital currency um the fear isn't about the cashlessness it's about the uh the oversight that the authorities will have over all of your activities going forward Damn, we sound so smart and when we get serious. This is cool. Good job, guys. Well, cannabis dispensaries, aren't they all cash businesses? Because I, I was having the same thought, Jason. Yeah, I feel like that sort of thing would really hurt pot businesses. Like lots and lots of money because they're cash-only businesses. But I'm not sure if that's still true. Yeah, federal governments can still do if they wish, or the federal government can still, if they wish to, because it's still federally illegal. I'm at, yeah, they still, and, and really they probably keep it that way just so they can literally rob a motherfucker. Of it's, their just money. Have, it's like the IRS code. It's so impossible to understand when you get it, when you get a law that's in rules that are so complex, there are no rules because they can interpret it any way you want. Unless you're like a CPA, you can, any of us, they can come after any of us for any reason to make our life a living hell, even if we don't eventually get convicted. Um, it's kind of a terrifying thing. Uh, if you think about it, I'm shaking in my boots. Moving on. 
uh, our next topic, uh, and this was a topic brought up by somebody who uh, chickened out. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh the this is the next topic is not really a topic uh it's more of a uh, kind of a remembrance and uh an homage uh, a trashing uh, uh, whatever you want to say uh this is a uh we about a uh a little over a year ago no a year let's spend it'll be two years this year is that correct two year two years two, two years, years that's right um we all one of uh, uh one of our friends from growing up uh, uh, friends, friend of me, maybe to one of us, I'm not sure. Um, uh, is a beloved uh, gentleman named by the name of Mario, and uh, he's he is somebody that uh, kind of had an impact on on all of us in in one form or another, and unfortunately passed away from uh, a long battle with cancer, uh, which uh, I'm sure Jason can describe a little bit more, but um. We had a when we had our a, a bit of a memorial forum in person uh, in the aftermath of that, um, but uh, the subject to him came up because he you know he's a character um, and in all of our life and he's still like you know uh, we still make references to him and uh, so we thought it'd be kind of a, a cool thing to to you know I, well I know three of us thought it would be a cool thing to uh, <laughs> to kind of to talk about our friend here. Uh, and, uh, so I don't, I don't know, let me let, uh, turn this over to Jason before, before we do that, before we get to yeah. Jason. So I just want to start with an apology. I'm going to address two groups. One, another piece of feedback besides Dave's unrelenting wokeness. Um, the, I got a lot of feedback about the episode where we talked about our origin because it was like unrelatable, right? Like how we met, it's just kind of alienates the people. So as you learned with your feedback and the 540 word critique, uh, calling me a white nationalist, calling Dave Woke, your feedback is appreciated and will be at best roundly ignored. Um, to quote uh, Joseph R. Biden, nothing will fundamentally change. To also quote uh, that old white guy, if you don't like the show, you ain't black. Um, the second, <laughs> second piece is let me apologize to all the people hurt, insulted, schemed against, cheated, violated, lied to for personal gains, stolen from, and or otherwise had the misfortune of becoming a host organism to Mario's personal brand of interpersonal toxicity. I just want to say, I understand, and you are not alone. I don't all know. right, so Mario Rodriguez. Uh, met him, Dave introduced me to him when I was, when we were 16. Uh, it was Thanksgiving Day that year, and uh, I was desperately searching for marijuana and nobody had any. And so I called Dave after <laughs> calling everybody I knew. Uh, Dave was like, I think I might know a guy who's got some. And uh, <laughs> and so he, we, he, I meet up with Dave and we go over to this guy Mario's house. And he, we ended up like walking around uh, smoking weed with him uh, on the railroad tracks. And from the moment I met the guy, he was like talking shit to me, like mad shit to me, like threatening to body slam me and shit. Just <laughs> absolutely absurd. Like, and I, I just thought, wow, you know, this guy's fucking crazy. And I was terribly amused. So we started hanging out. And uh, eventually he became my first boyfriend, mostly by default, because there was nobody else gay in town or at least nobody out. So we were like two little punk rock boyfriends going to queer core shows and, and, you know, at the Gilman and all that. And we were kind of joined at the hip for well, up until he died, basically, even after we broke up and everything and moved on. Um, we had periods of time where we didn't talk because we had big problems with each other, but uh, we were pretty much, you know, very close friends from the time I was 16 till the time that he died um, terribly and horrifically in the hospital uh, from a cancer that, ironically, we didn't even know he had until the last few days of his life. Um, he had cancer for a long period of time, but it was in his throat. Uh, and then he ended up getting diagnosed with uh colon cancer uh but he had beaten both of those and he had a hernia that because of covid they were supposed to be doing surgery on but they kept postponing his procedure 
because of COVID and they didn't want to, you know, have him come into the because it wasn't, you know, life threatening. Uh, but he kept having stomach pains that they would blame on this hernia of his. And uh, when he finally, the pain got so bad that he finally, I had to finally take him to the hospital. And while he was there, they discovered that he had a growth on his liver that had come over from his bowel and had metastasize and spread and there it was inoperable and there was nothing they could do except watch him slowly die uh and it was it was really awful because as as much shit as mario talked and as much balls as he had he was terrified of dying and uh the fear in his eyes the last time i actually was able to speak to him when he was conscious um was heartbreaking um the day after uh the last thing i said to him was you're not gonna fucking die shut up and then i left the hospital uh the next day dave was gonna go see him at the hospital and uh he before dave got there he had gone into cardiac arrest and was taken to the intensive care unit um and he never regained consciousness uh so for about a week they were trying to determine whether or not he would come out of the coma uh and i was his decision maker i was his caregiver so they kept asking me so do we keep him on life support or do we remove him from life support and i said well if you're telling me that you know there's a possibility that he could still wake up again uh then yeah keep him on life support at this point i didn't know that the cancer was inoperable the liver cancer was inoperable they wouldn't operate on him while he was in the coma but they seemed to say that there was some hope that they could get you know they could take care of it um he never did regain consciousness so after about a week um i called his sister who was his like last surviving immediate family member um in El Salvador and she flew up uh, the day before they removed him from life support and we sat with him while he passed away. And I don't know, it was a relief for me in a way because, you know, it, Mario was a complete pain in the ass. And uh, as much as I loved him, he was, just, you know, he was Mario. Um, and it was the most difficult decision I've ever had to make in my life to like say, yes, kill my friend, you know? Um, but it was the right thing to do. Uh, Cause you know, he would have just been in pain and, in, and miserable if he was actually awake. So I don't know. It's, it was really rough. And, uh, but uh, it's just all the little inside jokes and, and things that, that you kind of share with somebody will never make sense to anybody else ever again. And it's just, it, it's a really, it's a really sad thing to say the least. And I guess that's probably about all I have to say for the time being. Well said. So I think to anybody who ever was offended by Mario, we can, we can all take solace in knowing that it was a long, slow, painful death. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I'm, uh, thank you very much jason for sharing that um and uh one of the things that uh mario's friendship he came about uh he was a co-worker of another uh another friend of ours uh, uh who's who we've mentioned before in both meaningful times with friends and is in the in the meantime with me and dave episode where we all kind of had one of these first powwows uh dennis cullen um and he worked with him at burger king um and that's so that's primarily where uh mario's appearance in our lives stemmed from and by the way and when you say he worked at burger king he his primary income was stealing money from burger king the and he, but he also collected a paycheck he lived near my parents house and uh so i i visited him there i think i don't know a couple times or something and um and this is again some of my early my early wokeness before I even knew I was woke was uh yeah Jason and I were uh were you know obviously we 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 drugged together uh Mario uh I had I believe drugged with a couple of times 
and uh jason wanted weed i thought mario might have some and it turned out they did and little did i know that a, a love connection was would be made uh through my extreme <laughs> heterosexual relationships <laughs> with these two gentlemen there's friends that i have where i sometimes think that they already know each other and they haven't even met yet mario was one of these people where um i want to say there's there's certain people that i before the term even was coined i would absolutely call mario a hater uh and, <laughs> and i am a hater as well well and, i think if there's one thing that's true about when we were all younger and the one thing that drew us all together is collectively we were all a bunch of fucking haters oh totally man yeah. i mean still am we could just as easily call this show hater aid and, and it would apply so yeah we bonded in negativity i mean really it was drugs i mean i will point it i'm not gonna lie it was drugs i mean when you're but it, you want to do drugs more with people that again make you laugh mario made me laugh he introduced me also to some music uh you know some that i i enjoyed some that i didn't so much but it was anybody that else that had you know an outside perspective on music um would always be welcome in my my life but the uh the main thing that i i loved about mario was he's the only person who ever would tell me that i'm stupid and i would laugh at it um it mainly in the term you're hell stupid or, you're so stupid and just constantly telling me i'm stupid and i would laugh and uh and the, it, I don't know why that is. And it even when he tried to, when he tried to uh, re, be kind of like rehabilitated Mario after many years, we were texting uh, during the beginning of the pandemic or the, right around 2020. And he had, I had his number saved and I, uh, I said, I got your number saved. And I texted him a screenshot of, of him saved in my phone. And it was, I saved him as Mario, you're hella stupid, Rodriguez. <laughs> And he got <laughs> upset at that. <laughs> and, and he's like, oh, I wish you hadn't shown me that. I'm like, why? I'm like, I'm showing you that I saved you my phone. And he goes, oh, no, the you're hella stupid part. I'm like, really? You, you're upset at your catchphrase? It's the coolest thing about you, man. And, uh, yeah, he didn't like that. And I I, I get it. You know, I, I don't know. People take stock in their life. I don't want to speculate. I'm um, fighting a massive hamstring cramp right now. So I'm writhing around. And I know it's that motherfucker doing it from beyond the grave. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, when I when I fractured my shoulder last year, the first person I thought of was Mark. <laughs> if I suffer a massive coronary during this fucking podcast, you'll know what's what's really happening. It, it, it just the 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 because here's what I here's again what I love about the guy. So he would uh, chime in and be like. Hey, uh, I saw your Facebook thing. I'm never on Facebook, but he would always tell me that he was never on Facebook after he was just on Facebook. And he saw my post about looking for a uh, somebody to to borrow somebody's Disney Plus login, if anybody had one. And he said, oh, hey, uh, just so you know, I have Disney Plus, uh, but I'm not going to send you the login. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so deliberate. Like, like I was just like, you didn't even need to tell me you had Disney Plus, you jackass. Like, what? What? He was like, oh no, I just wanted to let you know that I had it, um, but I can't give you the. Lock. He would do things like that. The the last time that I spent with him, uh, where he was alive and in good health, oddly enough, was at Jason's place, and we were hanging out all day. He came over. And here's the here's the thing where I know my 12 step program has really helped me with my resentments because uh, we're sitting there, we're wondering, we're talking, you're like, hey, anybody want to watch a movie? Yeah, let's watch a movie. What, what's what's about that? Whatever. The Disney Plus I was using, my friend, he he had purchased Black Widow and they were talking like, oh, yeah, Black Widow's out. I don't know if that's on Disney Plus. I said, oh, you got to order it. But I have access to I mean, my friend has the Black Widow movie on Disney Plus and I offered him like, yeah, oh, they're all like, yeah, let's watch it. I totally missed my opportunity to say, I'm not going to log it in. Um, I, I just completely offered to use the Disney plus. And here's where the joke's on me. We watched Disney. We watched black widow and all Mario did through the movie was, was basically talk about how terrible Florence Pugh was. And who was my favorite part of the movie uh, plays black widow's sister. And he's just trashing her through the whole thing. And I was like, and I, I remember I'm like, we can turn this movie off. I'll turn this car right around. Uh, but it was a lot more fun to listen to Mario's hater aid, I will admit. Um wow. I 
Mario was for me a time one of my closest friends no joke uh, when he started hanging out with jason and they started going out uh jason was one of my best friends and i met him through jason obviously um we had some good times uh i loved his haterade uh that was one of the greatest things about him and uh i thought he had good music taste uh the drug thing was huge in life at that time we all got high all the time, did shrooms, took acid, the whole nine years, right? Like it was just such a part of life. Um, my favorite thing I ever did with, with Mario was one time we both were bored and Mario and I just, it was just us two hanging out for some reason. And so we used to go down to the marsh in Newark that was right by the Dumbarton Bridge. And there's a big rock jetty that separates the bay itself from these salt marshes that are out there. And Mario and I smoked a joint or something. And I remember we were walking and there was this giant, like a, you remember how big TVs used to be big tube TV things. Like we came across this huge old TV that was just sitting there that someone had dumped. And Mario was like, let's destroy it. So we, <laughs> we both, we picked up this piece of concrete that is what these big seawalls are basically made out of and chucked it into the screen of this TV. And the thing exploded like onto us, like with a giant, it was insane. And like just glass went everywhere and it was in our hair and all over our clothes. And like we were breathing in whatever powder and stuff flew out of this TV. It was insane. Like to this day, I'm like, what did we breathe in when we friggin' destroyed that TV? Um, but that was that was who Mario was like he had that punk rock edge to him where he was just that guy who was like, you know, hey, we're walking along a trail. It's beautiful. Look at the nature. Let's fucking destroy this thing. Like that was sort of the beauty and the fun of what I liked about Mario. But uh, uh, if I'm if I'm being honest, Mario was also my worst enemy uh, for a long time. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in life was when I was about 21. Uh, was thinking it would be fun to move into a house filled with my friends. <laughs> um, I had just gotten a full-time job. It was, this was like 96 or 97. Um, there was a house that Ramshackle Dan lived in. Our friend Doug lived there. Mario lived there. And at the time, I think there was a guy named Mike that lived there. You Mike, moved in after Mike. Mike, Mike moved there. out, and that, op that opened up for me to move in. Like, all right, I'm 21. This is going to be great. My parents want me out of the house because I have a full-time job, and I've left school. So the, the timing was right. Um, and that ended up, if I'm honest, being one of the worst mistakes of my entire life. Um, it caused me to have a falling out with my entire friend group. Um most of you, with the exception of Dave, I didn't speak to for over 20 years. And Mario was sort of the ringleader mm -hmm. of what caused all that friction. You know, and I was an asshole, too. I'm not going to place it all on Mario. I mean, we were all 21, 22-year-old fucking dickheads. But Mario went full-on, like, house Nazi on everybody. Like, talk about, like, creating lists of who's doing. Nathan will vacuum the house on July 7th at approximately 10, 20 a.m., and just we fought about drugs, who was stealing whose fucking weed. And then I started dating this woman who would eventually become my wife. She's now my ex-wife. But that caused all this friction in that fucking household. And uh, I think there was just one final massive blowout argument that I had with Mario. And I just was like, fuck it, I'm out. And I like literally moved everything I had out of that house like in an afternoon and didn't see Mario again for like 22 years. Not once. Not one phone conversation. Uh, not an email. I mean, this was probably before we sent emails out or had, you know, the internet and stuff. Um, and I, I, you know, I got to say, I deeply regretted that. I, I wish there had been some point within those years that there was some way to catch up. Um, it just never happened. Until the pandemic rolled around. The pandemic was sort of this big coming together of people um dave started doing these online comedy shows with his friend nina and i don't know maybe it was 2020 or 2021 um mario took in one of those comedy shows and we both started talking to each other again like dude is that are you is this nathan is this mario and um we exchanged phone numbers and we started texting again and just getting caught up you know he asked me about my family 
you know, my sister, how her kids are doing and just, you know, it was great. It was great to catch up again. And I saw him one time in person before he died. Um, <laughs> and mm. unfortunately, uh, you know, I think you can really reconcile <laughs> with friends. You can. You, you there Sometimes if you can, like, admit to each other, like, we were assholes, you know, like we can, like with Jason, for instance, like, you know, we talked again after all those years and things are cool. Like, but with Mario, it was, uh, uh, I remember why I remembered at that time why we stopped talking for 20 years. I'll put it that way. Um, and, and that's too bad. That's too bad. Uh, I wish it hadn't gone down that way, but we are who we are. Right. So I think we still um, had fun that day. <laughs> I did. Have... <laughs> I did despite that. And it, it proved, it provided some memorable moments. Like, you know, the catch Mario's other catchphrase was this sucks. This place, this place, this place sucks. sucks. <laughs> yeah. I remember that was the, the, the final words that I ever saw Mario personally say were this place sucks before he bounced out. But, uh, you know, even after that, even after that, we still texted each other, like, cause you know, we both had the mutual star Wars thing. So it wasn't, it wasn't all bad. I'm not going to say that's what it was, but, uh, you know, I feel like I couldn't come on and sugarcoat shit and say it was all good because I think know. part of his charm was the ugliness too. There was like, yeah, a charm I mean, the ugly side. when, when he was in my life and things were great, I, I, what I loved about him was his vitriol. And it's, especially when it, was, when it wasn't aimed at me, it was all fucking good. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, it, when it was aimed at me, it wasn't so yeah. deliciously evil. <laughs> yeah. Also, yeah. I don't know if you're aware. He was also cheating you and Doug on the phone bill. Just FYI. Oh. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> I mean, it was, what, 27 years ago? I mean, I I don't even remember half the bullshit we were even arguing about anymore. It's so trivial and doesn't even matter. You need to get it out of his estate. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. That's why Nathan, though, at, at his memorial, I could see Nathan just pocketing all Mario's shit. He's like, I'm going to pocket <laughs> I put, like, 10 papooses in my pockets that day just to fucking <laughs> get, get back at his ass. Oh, yeah, man. he worked for Pac Bell. Right. And so he told I had my own phone number. So I was kind of out of this and he worked for Pac Bell. So he got like a 25 percent discount on the phone bill. People are like, what is it? What does that even mean these days? But like he would he so he told Nathan and, and Doug, he's like, hey, let's put the phone bill in my name. It used to be in Doug's because Doug was the master tenant. And then I'll I'll give you, you know, we'll have to get a discount. What he did was he took his discount from himself and he overcharged both of you. So he was paying almost nothing. And <laughs> I walk in. I'm driving to the garage where the laundry was, right? And I'm like, I don't know how I figured this out, but I talked, I just like, hey, dude, I know what you're doing. Um, I'm not going to tell them, but if you ever try and pull that shit on me, I will fuck you up. And he just looked at me, he's like, okay. <laughs> like, but I think uh, Jason brought something into frame here. Yeah, I just, uh, it suddenly occurred to me that Mario should be here. Yeah. I'm sure he's there. And you know what he would say? He'd be like, this podcast sucks. Oh, are those his ashes? <laughs> yeah, this is his urn. That's him, man. <laughs> the big, giant block of he's a He's a bl <laughs> big black box. Yeah. <laughs> that makes me want to buy you a cat. This is Mario, everybody. Hell say, yeah. Mario. Hi, Mario. <laughs> Probably the best representation of him that I can think of. I didn't realize, Nathan, what you were going through. and I didn't realize he was he was doing that to you because he was doing that shit to me too. And he was causing, he was causing a lot of that shit between us and between everybody. I mean, Doug was kind of hands off because like Doug, you know, Doug was neutral. Uh, no, I, I think it was one thing to be Mario's friend and observe that behavior and be able to go home at the end of the day, but living with it full time was, was a whole different, a whole different thing. Like I said, I can't blame it all on Mario. I can't. Um, there were a lot of other factors that contributed to that whole shit show. And you and I have never talked about this, honestly. It's it's weird because this is, I think we have this deeply in common. Um, that that exact that's my exact my exact take. I lived with the dude for a long time. Like I lived in the uh uh the papa's house. Mario rented a room from a full on Nambla dude. Um and if you don't know what Nambla is, I'm not gonna explain to you. You just go make sure you Google it on a work computer. Um <laughs> <laughs> this was a, a boarding home for men. Um, it was it was Mario, and he didn't have a door. I don't know what that was about, but he had the room without a door. He had a curtain. Um, the man the man was independently wealthy. He apparently had brought like K Fox, like Acid Rock, to the Bay Area back in like the sixties or seventies. So Mario found one of his bank statements. He's like, this dude is freaking loaded, and he walked. He was an elderly man who walked around in tidy whities. Um, 
and he would refer to himself in the third person, right? He, he just look at you sometimes in a leering way and go, I'm up the nose. And he he would, <laughs> he would when he was calling Mario, he'd go, Mario! <laughs> that was the best. That was like everyone would call Mario Mario. Right. We would all say Mario. Right. And uh and so he I mean he told like that dude invited me into his bed. Uh he also like put his hand on my face and like looked at my acne. He's like, you know what this is? I'm like, acne's not like, no, those are spots from jerking off. And <laughs> like he was just creepy, but like you gotta understand, like, I mean, you guys understand is like the sense of humor that we had, we thought it was just fucking funny. Like, he obviously wasn't going to overpower us and penetrate us anally or orally. So it was like, there's just this fucking creepy dude who had these, like, and I'll say this. There were 18-year-old boyfriends that would come in, and he was, like, the world's lamest sugar daddy. Like, fucking bottom shelf, like, Wolf Schmidt vodka of sugar daddies. Like, he would let them fucking do laundry at his house and drive his, like, 74 caddy and then suck his dick. Like, was, the, guy had, the guy had, like, fucking serious like miser game and i we all knew this right and so anyways i got kicked out of my house i go home one day and i got a keep out sign and all my shit's in the garage he's like chain locked my fence um when my mom was out of town and like i had no place to go so mario's like there's a room for rent here i'm like sure because <laughs> again papa says you're welcome yeah i mean <laughs> yeah. anyways like, so moving there um, and then eventually that lifestyle got old because at the time I had a girlfriend, there were no girls allowed in the house. Like that was fucking red line you did not cross. Like no bitches leave. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, you figure at that age, it was probably hard for him to conjure up an erection um, when he had these young dudes. So he didn't want anything fucking salty in that game. That was a good relationship at the time because we had a we had a common enemy, which was this filthy old man. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we then um, Dennis was moving out of that house and. Uh, so he and I teamed up with Doug. Doug had a good job. He's like a forklift operator for Hitachi. Um, I think I worked for the city at the time. Uh, Mario was stealing money from Burger King. So we all were like able to muster enough uh, <laughs> to get in there. And then we met this guy, uh, this guy, Mike, who was a freak. His catchphrase was rockin'. And I remember. Oh my God, that's right. I, <laughs> he had a, he had a picture of fucking, he had a poster of Shirley Manson and Aquaman. Those were his two posters. And he said, he's like, Shirley Manson is the most beautiful woman in the world, right? And he had this <laughs> feminine affect. He'd come home every fucking day from work, and he would lock himself in the bathroom in the hallway for like 35 minutes straight with dead silence. No flushing, no water, just dead silence. I don't know what he was doing. I like to imagine he was like gripping his penis head and just fucking <laughs> punching it over and over again for 35 minutes just to like get whatever was in there out. Um uh, <laughs> And then I asked him about the, you know, the Aquaman poster, because that's a weird superhero, right? And he's like, do you know any other superhero that commands 70% of the planet? And I'm just like, <laughs> actually a pretty good freaking point, dude. So one time Mario and I are in the kitchen and we we're talking about like, um, we're, I don't know, we're just in the kitchen talking shit. And I was like, hey, like, would you, would you fuck MC Hammer in the ass? And he's like, no, nah, I wouldn't do that. I'm like, I'm like, for how much money? He's like, I just don't think I'd get an erection. I'm like, well, for like a million dollars, I would like fucking duct tape my dick to like a splint and then like wrap it in a, in a condom. And then Mike walks and he's like, um, I am too much of a raging heterosexual for this conversation. And he went to his room. <laughs> <laughs> that like, that was like a typical, that was like a normal conversation that we would be having. Like uh, we just, you know, this is the thing, like, I know Nathan, you have the, the that long time on the regret for me. I feel like I binge, I binge relationship like a 30 year relationship into like a three to four year period. Like I didn't think about the guy anymore, honestly. And, and I feel like I spent fucking like every waking moment around that guy. Like we went grocery shopping together. We did drugs together. We spent every evening watching TV, listening to music, like wherever he went, I went wherever I went, he went for the most part. Um, and it wasn't even like we particularly liked each other. It was just that we were always around each other for a long ass time. And I will say this kind of calling back to the last episode, that dude was a miserable SOV, but you could you could talk shit to him um, and be deeply personal. And if it was good, like if I fucking nailed him, he would just cackle. Like it, he he would disconnect from the personal nature of what I was saying mm -hmm. to him and just bust up at how good the insult was. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'll appreciate that. And, I, and I, I don't need to go back into what Nathan is saying. I will say I had almost the exact same experience with him that Nathan did. Um, he was conniving. He was... Uh, I would say the world's like least ambitious politician. 
Like he was kind of like doing like our friend group, like fucking house of cards. And it's like, why? Like if you're that fucking cutthroat and you're that fucking like mean spirited and selfish, like you should do something be like join politics. But instead he decided to, to focus all his weird manipulation and, and backstabbing and pitting people against each other in our friend group. But that being said, um, I, I wouldn't spend that much time with someone who wasn't fucking entertaining. And he was, he was a great shit talker. Uh, he was the only person who can compete with me in terms of how far he could spit a loogie. Um, that was an ongoing, <laughs> that was an ongoing, uh, battle. Um, you know, he was, he was great to drop acid with. He was great to do shrooms with. And like, there's, you got to say something about that, right? Cause someone is, if someone isn't like a decent, like something at its core, you can't do like psychedelics like that much mm-hmm. with somebody if they're that bad. And I think a lot of it's probably, you know, in old age, like Nathan said, we're all kind of pieces of shit to varying degrees. Um, and I think, you know, I think his was just more direct and uh, probably less, less hidden. Um, and maybe that was by intention, but like, I mean, I sat, it was just me and him doing like psychedelics together a lot and not one, not one moment during that time. I was like, I don't want to be around this guy. You know, like one time, uh, we were, uh, we were doing streams our room, listening to music and Doug came home like hammered drunk from, uh, from the billiards place. And we walk outside and again, we're on a lot of mushrooms and Doug is on the porch area on his hands and knees in a fucking lake of his own vomit. He and I just started fucking cracking up, right? And we're like, hey, what happened? And Doug's just like, I had uh, two beers at the pool hall and this, and he's <laughs> drinking a 40, right? On his, on his, uh, on his knees. And all he could do was like muster up like the energy to light a cigarette. And he's just like sitting there on his hands and knees in his fucking own vomit, smoking a cigarette. He and I are fucking tripping balls and like laughing hysterically. And he's gotten, Doug still got his 40. And all I could say was like, you gonna finish that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Doug, to his credit, takes a cigarette out of his mouth, fucking throws it into his own vomit to extinguish it, and he just reaches over to me with the forty. He's like, "Nah, go ahead and kill it." <laughs> Again, I think I, one of the reasons why I, I knew I, I thought it was a good idea to even do this is because, regardless of the histories, we all I think had a had a profound respect for the guy uh, for for what positives he did bring and there and there are negatives that I'm sure stem you know if you want to psychoanalyze it he's from El Salvador uh don't know his exact childhood and all that but you know you develop obviously uh you know uh defense mechanisms uh in how you you know interact with the world and my hunch again as I maintained a I would say a healthy distance with him so that any time that I would see him I was always I was you know I was happy to see him. And there, and he definitely would try to throw shade my way. One of the times that I was unaware of it was when uh, it was at the house when I was I was over there hanging out with Dennis, and he was living there, and he uh, he saw me sitting smoking weed, drinking or something or whatever uh, in the house, and he was like, you know, there's just you, you know, there's just you're so opulent, and I was like, oh, somebody's somebody's got a new fancy word they want to they want to show to me. <laughs> opulent was the word of the day and uh so i had to look that up and then be like oh fuck you mario opulent and then when i mentioned it to to anybody uh who you know they were like that's funny coming from mario probably the most opulent motherfucker uh whatever <laughs> but but that's and that's you know that was his way and i think it's hilarious when i see this black box that he's in because it reminds me of uh of like the hellraiser box only if you like <laughs> if you like worked it out he would just come out of the puzzle and be like rather than eviscerate you with chains or whatever he'd just be like you're hell stupid you know just something <laughs> just come out of the box and tell you how fucking what, what uh, just a hate on you um but uh kind of echoing the the lsd point you know those are our that's our subconscious at work uh, whenever you're when you're around people that you're comfortable with under psychedelics and uh yeah i i definitely I, we one of the times that that i tripped with him we went to go see the empire strikes back together <laughs> uh when it was uh brought back into the movie the- he, he invited me he's like hey man you want to go see empire strikes back i'm like yeah sure whatever and I, I don't know who had the 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 hits but we decided yeah let's do hits too so we went and during the whole time, uh, not the whole time, but for the most part, uh, he dropped the little seed in my brain of like, did I ever tell you my theory on uh, on Star Wars? And I was like, no. What, what theory? He's like, the the Empire are just all gay. <laughs> <And> like, <laughs> the, 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 there's no women in it. 
yeah again like i always remember a lot of the the awkwardness is fondly but the the thing was is is, is my last interactions with them were also uh taped with with the with both sadness and humor as they had to be uh jason mentioned earlier that yeah i i the day I went to go visit the funny thing about the day I went to go visit him, I was doing a makeup for a day that I said I would go visit with him, but I didn't. And I didn't, I was unaware that during COVID he was only allowed one visitor per day for the hospital. And I told Jason that, yeah, I think I'll go by on Sunday, uh, which then got to Mario and, uh, and then I didn't go. And, uh, and I didn't, bother to tell anybody i didn't think any it would you know i was just me and my you know just day-to-day self-centeredness and uh i i got a call from mario like hey why didn't you show up and i said oh oh shit like i was uh i forget what the whole deal it might have been the same day as comedy day it was it was the same day as comedy day in the park and i was performing there and uh, i was gonna try and work it around that but i didn't and um so i said well i, I can make it out there on tuesday if uh and and also prior to that though he called me when he first was coming back in the hospital and um and he was in he was in he called me a few times but the time on friday was where i heard the fear i heard it what jason was talking about uh seeing in his in his eyes of the that fear and he was he was he said dave i don't think i'm gonna make it I, i'm i'm very scared and you know i was at my mom's house in ukiah at the time and i said well um not a religious person or anything like that i'm not either but in my recovery i've come to come to kind of embrace the thought of a higher power and and this that and the other and was talking a little bit about it and then i i brought mario i gave him his strength back he goes dave why the fuck are you talking to me about all this shit and i said well um i guess you know you don't you don't he goes i don't fucking believe in any <laughs> and like he just chastises me for the thought of a god or a higher power and i'm like well now i've talked to you so long about it now you're you're embracing the idea of death and he started laughing <laughs> <laughs> and, and then yeah and he and he was he was laughing in good in just in good spirits of the phone call um by the time we got off the phone and so it kind of made him forget his you know his fear of death at the at the moment are your little girls almost done yeah we're almost done pop this is my dad over here yeah so <laughs> um, call little girls? He, he wants to eat we're doing we're having breakfast wait did he call us little girls it's, it's hey hey we're like, you're talking about a friend who passed away have a little respect i don't yeah I, yeah well, <laughs> sure. he must have known, must have known we'll talk about you one day all right so <laughs> and, um you're the only remaining like, all their dad's passed on pop so we should you know <laughs> Enjoy it. Do you want to pass on <laughs> no i don't i want to say appreciate it. these are my good these are, these are, these are, work on that. that's mario acting through my father right there all right so uh but no he ended up uh what was it um so the day the last day i was supposed to see him i said i'd be there on tuesday and he asked me to bring him uh what was the brand of juice he liked jason oh currants Kearns. He wanted me to get him a can of Kearns. And uh, so I was making every effort to find a, a, a can of Kearns. And where I went, they didn't have Kearns. Uh, they they only had another juice. So I got that juice knowing full well that I was going to get chewed out for bringing the wrong juice. And uh, and that's <laughs> so. And then uh, I showed up and I talked to him that morning. He was making sure that I was going to still show up. He was it was he talked. I think I talked to him at noon. Um, and it was probably only a matter of minutes later that he went into the cardiac arrest. Um, cause when I got to the hospital, I knew what his room number was and it wasn't that he was in the ICU and they made me wait like 45 minutes, uh, before I was, it was so awkward sitting there. I was the only person sitting there that people were like randomly checking. And there was this one woman who was very, it was totally like a woman that was kind of in the spirit of Mario who like saw me there and she's like, um, yeah, you can't see him. You know, she she just was really indignant in the in the whole thing of like, like, you know, you can't see him yet or whatever. And she wasn't even she wasn't a nurse there. She was she was handling like the all the, the towels and the linens. Um, and then the person who was caretaking for him uh, came over to me like 45 minutes later and was like, oh, are you here to see see Mario? And I'm like, yeah. I've been waiting here and uh and so she took me back there and yeah so i saw him he was uh you know unconscious looking very awkward i just remember his feet weren't covered up 
and uh and the lady started talking to me like basically like i'm visiting the lady now because i'm looking at my friend who is you know i didn't know at the time but yeah it was pretty much you know not with us and all i could really think about was the fact that well at least i'm not going to get chewed out for bringing the wrong juice um <laughs> Because I knew that was gonna get, I knew I was gonna get a heap of shit for that. Like I asked for currents, Dave, and you brought me this shit. Um, but again, guess to kind of, yeah, to kind of echo that that you know, there's bittersweetness to the guy. That's and uh, and again, Jason knew him, was closest with them, and all that. I'm grateful I got to have uh, what times I had with them, and was able to to reconnect with them, you know, enough to, in the end, to still again uh, uh, have have fond memories of the guy. Yeah, so. I feel the same way. Despite everything, I'm really happy that I got to reconnect with him before he died. One hundred percent. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad that I walked away from him when I did and never looked back. I ran into him once, um, <laughs> like a couple times. I just ran into him in the street, just like you know, hey, how you doing? Whatever. Didn't exchange information or anything. It was just cordial. Um, yeah, good for him. R.I.P. Indeed. The song Jason said that uh, a Mario song is L7's Death Wish. And uh, I listened to I haven't listened to it in years, listened to it last night. And I thought two words, hella stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was this was the quintessential Mario band, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I don't know. Was his favorite band. It was difficult picking a song uh, because my first instinct was to pick a song called slide, which I personally think is like one of the best rock songs ever written, but we, and we, you know, we both like, we're really into that song a lot, but there's like, you know, there are three people who sing in that band. And so he was a big fan of Danita Sparks who sings death wish. I personally love Susie Gardner who uh, sang slide. So I was like, I wanted to pick slide, but then I was like, well, no, cause it needs to be a Danita song. And then I was like, well, Fast and Frightening, because, of course, you know, it's like kind of a go to L7 song. But then that just seemed like a little boring. But then it just seemed appropriately resonant to pick a song called Death Wish. That's just about, all about a person being totally self-destructive because, um, you know, we it all at some point or another in our lives have been incredibly self-destructive. So it seemed. And yet and yet so not wishing for death as we well, come to understand the underlying reality of, of all. So the irony. Is all, the I mean, I think this is the funny thing is that I, you know, I've spent all, like a lot of my behavior in my life. I've come to recognize was all kind of like the duty to do the joke about being too lazy to commit suicide, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just kind of like slow rolling my own, my own demise, you know? Uh, so it's just funny to me in a way that, Mario and Gary have both died and I'm the one who's still alive because I was the one who treated my body the worst and was the closest to death, you know, except, well, I don't know, Mario was pretty damn close to death a couple of times. But it's like, out of the three of us, I figured I'd be the one who died first, you know? Mm -hmm. but, God damn it, now I'm the only and one. For those who don't know, Gary was was your roommate, uh, your roommate and, uh, and another ex, but a, a dear friend of yours. For 20 right. years. Not yeah. Two. So, yeah yeah um uh yeah so it's just it kind of i thought it was kind of i thought it'd be funny to pick death wish but also it's a fucking killer tune uh it's a simple effect. song yeah it's it, the l7 one of the things that i uh is their their probably their strongest suit is style because yeah. uh all of their songs you could play when you learn basic guitar but uh, their tones and their, that's the thing I because it's it's literally like one note for most of the song. They're um, very Ramones like, not in that they mm -hmm. sound like the Ramones, but you know, no, they they're are. a Ramones song. Yeah. They all kind of sound like a Ramones song. Formula. That, that's yeah. what L Seven to me has always been like. It's yeah. very, they sound like L Seven, and most of their songs sound the same. Yeah, this one though, I, I would have to say is like one of the laziest songs I've ever heard. I mean. There are good songs they have for sure, and their sound. I completely agree. There's this, there's this tone and this uh, feeling to their music that is very specific to them. Um, and I like, I like the their music. This is not a good song. It's really, really, really boring. And there's no changes in it. Like their chorus is a drum roll. Like it just, yeah, it, it just is, goes yeah. back in. And I found myself. First of all, the song didn't need wishing to be for death. There you go. No, it's, sorry. It's, yeah, I don't even get the lyrics yet. Like it's just a drum roll. The drumming carries this entire fucking song. Like this, the the other guitarist could have like sat down and taken a nap during the song. There was no need for it. 
like the second guitar. It was just this really, really dull droning um, song. And like I said, the drums were really good. The lyrics sound like like some shitty attempt at like edgy poetry when you're a teenager. It's like, he got a car that goes real fast. He got a life, but it won't last. Doesn't even look disturbed when his Chevy takes off the curb. I mean, that's not even, that's not even like trying. I don't think it was attempts at poetry at all. No, it was attempt. It was just rock and roll attitude. That's all. Yeah. 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 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Poorly executed. The attitude was there for sure. The song was barely, barely listenable. Um, I like said, I I thought it was listenable. It was catchy song. No, it's not. There's what it, yeah, it is. What's catchy? A catchy is a hook. This is just like dun, 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 one dun, note. Yeah, dun, dun, one dun, note. Dun, 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 drum roll. Dun, 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 dun. And there's like there's no redeeming factors about this song other than. I'm gonna find yeah. a snot locker song and rub it in your face uh, with it's the same drummer, formula. The, co- the commonality with snot locker is the drummer. I'm all in my suit. suit. The drummer was also the most talented member of snot locker. Mm. Anyways, this song is the worst one we've listened to in terms of musicality. It was I, I was. Uh, floored by how terrible it was. Well, I'd rather listen to this than it's... "Damn, I Wish I Was Your Lover." To be there, you go. Honest. Yeah, and, and um, not only that, I think it's totally appropriate in in being Mario's choice and and your least favorite. So, L <laughs> Seven had some decent songs. You do? You, I'm sure you all remember when Mario went through his serial mom phase, right? Like when that's he just was watching that movie over and over again. I love that movie because of Mario. But there was L Seven makes an appearance in that movie. That's what they call themselves, what, Camel Toe? Or, I can't <laughs> The Camel Toes, something camel, to that camel effect. Lips. Camel Lips. Camel Lips, that's what it was. But the, they do a song in that movie called Gas Chamber. And that is my favorite song by them. That song rocks. I like that song. But it's way better than the one we did for today. I I, like you know what's funny about Elsa? I don't have a favorite song by them. I, and I had the two primary albums of theirs, the, the one that Death Wish was on. And whatever and it's mainly because they all sound like like l7 to me was sort of like the female mud honey um where mud honey had a lot of songs that were fairly similar yet i don't i don't have a favorite of any and i listened to them but i it was weird like i i wanted to like l7 more than i did kind of thing um you know and actually a band that i really do love that's one of my favorite bands of all time uh is uh lost goat they're from the bay area um they were around uh during the 90s and to me, that was that's where L seven. I was I was like, if L seven had stronger musicianship in their songs, like was kind of more of a, a metal derivative band, uh, I might have liked them more because they had all of the, the 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 tones of everything they had was, were amazing. But their actual songs, I was just like, I can play this, and if I could play it, I always would have like kind of a lesser of a respect for it. Same I felt about Nirvana, so. All right, so yeah, that was stupid. Um, all right, I think we got it. No. Later, Mario. Uh, uh, thanks for thanks for the memory, and uh, yeah, a lot of love and all that shit. And uh, yeah, so we'll be back again another time, another meaningful time with friends, uh, human, you know, alive and passing.